Hello, Toby Jones here and welcome back to the channel. Today it's time for another music discussion and today it's inspired by the Scorpions. And the whole topic of this is, I haven't really thought of a formal title for this yet, but basically is it, do we get tired of the old classic albums and listen to the new ones by default? Or is there something else behind the scenes that making us do that? And it's all inspired by this one very album. Scorpions to Return to Forever released in 2015. So a bit of backstory before we go into the main topic of the video. I started listening to the Scorpions probably in lockdown 2020-2021 and at that point I'd probably heard Love Drive, Animal Magnetism and Blackout which for those of you who might not be fans of the band are three of their most successful albums uh, released in their heyday 79, 80 and 82. About I think about 18 months ago now, or possibly even two years ago, I bought a job lot from eBay of the Scorpions collection. All of the Scorpions CDs, in fact I might even show something up the top there, if I've got um, a picture, which I think I still have because I've posted it online. And the only album that was missing at that time from that collection was this, uh, Return to Forever, released in 2015. Now before I managed to actually buy this, I listened to most of the Scorpions catalogue. There are a couple of albums that are still missing, uh, in terms of me listening to them, I've listened to most of them. The Sting in the Tail album from 2010, I've heard a couple of tracks, from, but not listened to that in full. Um, Humanity, Hour One, which was 2008, I think. I've listened to that once, wasn't too keen on it, so I might go back at, at some other point. But apart from that, I've listened to the majority of the Scorpions albums at least once. But I bought this quite a long time later, waiting for it to come for a decent price. I think I got it off eBay for four or five pounds. And then boom, I bought it, and that was it. And pretty well, as soon as I, as soon as I bought it, I listened to it. And you'll notice that throughout the videos in this channel, I tend to have quite a lukewarm response to albums the first time round. It's quite rare that I'll listen to something, and straight away it clicks. My favourite album of all time, as it stands, Pink Floyd, The Wall. The first time I listened to it, I thought, oh my god, what was this drivel? Probably wasn't helped by the fact that I had it on my iPod on shuffle. That doesn't really help with a uh, a conceptual album that follows a theme like that at all, does it? But a lot of albums I don't really click with the first time. Maybe Animal Magnetism was one of those that straight away I thought, wow, this is fantastic, it's got a really energetic feel. And I got that through a album job lot. It wasn't a job lot, actually, it was a bundle, because there's a distinction in there between a bundle, which I guess is five to ten items, and then a job lot, which is any more than that. Have you noticed that? I'm digressing. And I have made some notes here, because... This is a video that could very much go on a big tangent, so I'm trying to keep myself in focus here. Animal Magnetism I bought in that um, vinyl bundle when I was buying vinyl records. Again, watch a previous video to find out why I'm, what, uh, why I'm buying CDs now, but don't do that till you've watched this one. Enjoyed that album straight away. Bought Blackout, enjoyed that. Love Drive, uh, then Taken by Force, Savage Amusement, Crazy World. I'll mention Love at First Sting in just a while. But anyway, um, listen to all those albums. Animal Magnetism was and still is my favourite. Blackout, Taken by Force. There's probably five or six albums that are really, really up there for me, for uh, the Scorpions. And, and again, a couple of all other decent albums um, after that. So, Return to Forever, coming into that thinking it's a newer album. Generally, and you probably shouldn't come with this mindset, generally you think, right, the band... And this is going to sound critical, and I'm going to reverse this opinion later. And this was my opinion at the time. The band's past it, and it's not going to be the best album. And again, I listened to it for the first time. There, was a, there were a few tracks that I thought, oh, they're good. In particular, The Scratch, which had got a real energetic feel to it. Um, Catch Your Look and Play and Rolling Home. They were my favourites on the album. But as I started to listen to it more and more and more, I started to enjoy some of the other tracks, some of the slower tracks, House of Cards. Um... We built this house. The only track I'm not a fan of of this album is Gypsy Life. But barring that, um, I, I like all the tracks on this album. But herein lies the interesting bit. Um, this has probably been my heaviest rotation album for the last 12 months. So the first time I played this album was the 1st of May 2023. And since then, I can't remember a time when I wasn't listening to it in some way or form in the month, if you like. So it's always been in my rotation of music. But is it the best Scorpion album? No. 
Definitely not. It's a good album. It's got some good tracks. I listen to it a lot, but it's at their best output. Can you compare it against this album? Their best, in my opinion, Animal Magnetism. Can you compare it against Blackout, Taken by Force? No, I don't think so. But I was having one of these thoughts in the shower, and uh, I'll add some context to that. Sometimes you think about the meaning of life. Fortunately, sometimes I can divert and think about music and my thoughts about that, which is a much more pleasurable experience to have um, thinking about that, about, uh, about music and how different albums fall in your album ranking. But I watched a album ranking from Phil Aston from Now Spinning Magazine a couple of months ago, which was his Judas Priest album ranking. And he said something that resonates with me at the start of that review, because I myself do find it difficult sometimes to rank albums and the main content I did on this channel a while ago was album reviews, but I've started to get a bit frustrated with that because I found it difficult because, and it's the same with ranking films these days, there's, there's, there's only much of a muchness between these albums, so it's so tight, how do you possibly rank them? Well, Phil's method is to rank the albums by the ones he plays the most. Therefore, by that logic, Return to Forever should be way at the top of my list. But it's not. It's it's certainly nowhere towards the bottom. Um, it's proper up, It's probably upper mid-range. But as I say, um, Animal Magnetism, Taken by Force, Blackout, Savage Amusement. Possibly those four. Could I put it fifth or am I forgetting some? Taken by Force, Love Drive. Taken by Force, Love Drive, Animal Magnetism, Blackout, Savage Amusement, and maybe even Crazy World. So it's probably 6th, 7th, 8th, possibly. And then, of course, you've got this album as well, which I'll talk about in a second, Love at First Stink, which hovers in there as well. But is it my favourite album? No. So that then brings into the for a different discussion line. And it's the question I asked at the start. Do we get tired of the old classic albums? By that, I mean the band's big hit. And then discover a love for other albums after that. Now this is a this is a different discussion to that of, and I've got I've brought my props with me. It's a different discussion to underrated albums. So in Queen's case, we had the, a night at the opera, and then we had the album after that, a day at the race, and even then even News of the World could qualify for this possibly, but this was the the big album. Um, uh, it's a difficult contest, but I'd probably say Night at the Opera is slightly better. But this is a this is a very good album in its own right. But it's it is a bit of a cliche of the whole underrated albums argument. That's not really the argument I'm trying to make here. I'm trying to make a point about albums that just aren't really looked at at all as a band's greatest output. Yet I seem to listen to quite a bit. So it's it, it is it is an interesting. Um, dynamic here. So there's a, there's a couple of additional albums um, I want to talk about, and then I'll, then I'll come back to the Scorpions. Um, so obviously, in the case of ACDC, um, their best album, in my opinion, um, it, it, it is. I know some people have debated differently, but for me, it's difficult to argue against Back in Black. And then we have their 2014 album, uh, Rock or Bust, ten years ago now, and I don't think the no, you can you can kind of see it on the camera, but it doesn't quite work. It has got quite a cool. Let's see if it ah it does it, it does it even on the camera. Look at that. See we've we've developed my own 3D effects on video, um, but it, it's got quite a cool cover. But that's not that's not the main thing. Um, Rock or Bust, I think, is a better album. And see this 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 is very close to the underrated argument. Rock or Bust is a better album than I think some people give it credit for. And um, again, in the last 12 months, two years, I've been listening to more of this. So tracks like Baptism by Fire, Hard Times, Dogs of War, in particular, the album tracks, I think, are quite strong. But does it compete with, does it compete with Black, Back or Black? Back or Black. Back in Black? Definitely not. Um, another argument here, and this is going to be completely left field. So Kiss, Destroyer, their best album by many. Maybe on this occasion I'd be tempted to go elsewhere. Maybe even picking this album as their best. Possibly. It's close. 
But then we have their 1989 album, which was very much poo-pooed by a lot of people, Hot in the Shade, because it had that ballad on it forever that was a big hit, co-written by Michael Bolton, which really cheesed people off. But again, there are some good tracks on here. Uh, Rise to It, the first track, is really good. I like Silver Spoon. Cadillac Dreams is a bit of fun. The Street Giver from the Street Take Up Away. So, what's my point here? Well, this album recently I've played more and more. So even tracks like Read My Body, um, Read My Body, Cadillac Dreams, I've played those a bit more often recently. So, do I do I get sick of listening to Detroit Rock City, God of Thunder, Do You Love Me, even Flaming Youth, which is... Fl Flaming Youth is a good example here because it's an album track. But because it's on that big album and you listen to that album in its totality quite regularly, even the album tracks you maybe get a little bit sick of. So my argument here is, do albums like this, and this is a good example because to be fair, out of the three I've mentioned, it's probably the weakest in terms of an argument against the big album. Are these albums actually any good? Or are we only playing them, or I should talk about myself, because I'm not talking for everybody. Am I only playing them because I'm getting a little bit tired of the old album? And a different debate here, is it because I want to hear new things? Am I? Is it because I'm maybe a completionist who wants to look at the albums from different artists? Possibly. It could be something to do with that. It could also be something to do with, and I found this a lot, especially with stuff that I don't like. So I've said before that I usually have quite a lukewarm reaction to albums when I first listen to them. Even stuff I don't like, and I'm trying to think of an example while I'm talking because I haven't made a note about that. Even stuff I don't like, if I listen to it enough, I'll actually not mind it. It's it's an interesting debate. Let me just let me just have a look on on here, see if I can conjure up any um, any arguments. In fact, perfect example, perfect example. I've got it right in front of me. Um, so I'm, I'm going to come back to the Scorpions for a second, and I appreciate I've I've asked a lot of questions and not answered them, and I might not be able to answer them because this is an interesting debate that's just a, almost a pondering discussion more than anything. So we have this album here, which I said I was going to talk about um, a little bit later in the show when, when I discussed it earlier on. Um, this, and certainly in this country, the UK, Love at First Sting and Crazy World were the, I believe it was in this country, were the two best sellers of the Scorpions. Um, I went to see the Scorpions a fortnight ago today at Wembley Arena, and they were excellent. I might even do a review of that show in, in, in time. And it was the 40th anniversary of the Love at First Sting album. So it was the 40th anniversary tour. I'd never seen the Scorpions before. Like everything with the bands the age they are now, you want to go and see them because it could be your last chance. That's exactly what I did with Judas Priest when I went to see them in March as well. So I, was, I, was, I wouldn't say I was put off by the fact it was the Love at First Sting tour, but I thought, well, look, even if they play all the tracks from Love at First Sting, which comes in at nine tracks... A band is going to play 16, 17, 18 tracks, even more possibly in their set. So there's going to be good value. And don't get me wrong, the, I don't dislike everything off this album. There are probably um, three really good tracks. And that's the first track, Bad Boys Running Wild. The second track that nobody wants to hear again, but I'll come back to that in a second. That's another interesting idea. Rocky Like Hurricane. And then Coming Home, which is what Scorpions came out with um, at Wembley. But a track that... I'd listened to a couple of times and never really got on with was Still Loving You. Which is a big surprise because a lot of the Scorpions ballads I really like. Holiday from Love Drive. Um, Born to Touch Your Feelings from Taken by Force. Lady Starlight from Animal Magnetism. When the Smoke is Coming Down. You Give Me All I Need is a halfway house, I think, from Black Eight in terms of being between a, a ballad and a rock track. But Still Loving You from Love at First Sting, I'd never got it. Decent track, but that's about it. Anyway, in the, on the encore at Wembley, of course, they played the two tracks from this album, Rocky Like Hurricane, Still Loving You. And that performance was awesome, of Still Loving You. And I got home, 
on the following day, listened to the track and looked at it in an entirely new light. Entirely new light. Similar to that, when I went to see Judas Priest at uh, the NIA in Birmingham in March. Uh, Stained Class is my favourite Judas Priest album. But Saints in Hell is a great track, but not my favourite off the album. I think Saints in Hell was the only track off Stained Class that Judas Priest played that night. Again, I did the same. Come home a couple of days later and thought, wow, it's a tremendous track. So is it when you see things live or in a different light or you watch a DVD concert that you think, ooh, that's actually quite a good track? The same argument for ACDC again. On their ACDC live album, which I'll just go and get off the, the shelf, uh, I've got the two CD collector's edition of this, which is a great live album uh, taken from the uh, late 80s, early 90s tour. And track six on disc one is Heat Seeker from the Blow Up Your Video album. Again, another album that, um, after the underrated King flick of the switch, uh, you had Fly on the Wall, then Blow Up Your Video, and Blow Up Your Video wasn't seen as that great. But I've, from an early age, I've always liked Heat Seeker, and that is because of this album. So is there another argument that when you hear a track live, that it's a bit different? Same argument again for ACDC. Um, I had the Iron Man 2 soundtrack. And one of the tracks on that album was Cold Hearted Man. Which was, I think, an outtake from the Power Ride sessions. It certainly wasn't on the CD album. I think it was possibly on the album in some regions. Again, because of that album and it being on there, I really liked it. The same album, Iron Man 2, they featured a couple of the tracks from the Black Ice album from 2008. War Machine being one of them. Awesome track. Love it. Um, Rock and Roll Train, which starts the Live at River Plate live album. Fantastic track. That is, and I think I saw a poll somewhere, that Rock and Roll Train is was ranked one of the best rock tracks of the 2000s. I might be a little bit, but I know it was one poll that was similar to that. I saw it a while ago. So is it when you come back to something in a different light that you appreciate it more? And that, and that makes the argument more for the big albums. So, as with Animal Magnetism, um, which you can see, this is the um, Digipack version. This is the 2015 50th Anniversary Deluxe Edition. And the reason I bought these, and again, this is a bit of a sidetrack. I might do a separate video about them. Um, I actually didn't buy these, in fairness. Magnetism, Taken by Force, and Blackout I had for either Christmas or birthday. I can't quite remember. I had them, I'd asked for them for Christmas or birthday because I'd got the 2001 remasters of those albums and they're famously known for being very loud, um, loud and tinny and not good to listen to at all. But if you'd listen to Animal Magnetism from the first track, Make It Real, it's just noise. And funnily enough, I've been listening to a couple of tracks on iTunes before preparing for this video from um, now that's what I call Power Ballads uh, Richard Marks Hazard and uh, something else I can't quite remember and those tracks again I put the volume right up and it's just it's just noise and I'm not a music engineer I've got no experience in that field but it's just noise now these are absolutely tremendous because obviously rock music you want to play loud if you can and Love Drive is the one I bought last week. I've just recently bought that one uh, as the 50th anniversary. And I played it. I cranked it up again. Not, not a fantastic system. Just some bog standard Logitech speakers and uh, a bit of bass on the top. And I cranked that up to the loudest volume. And there was, no, there was no loudness. There was no distortion in it. The sound was absolutely fantastic. But coming back to my main point. I hadn't listened to Love Drive Obviously, apart from hearing, did they? They only, I think, they only, they played coast to coast the instrumental at the concert at Wembley. But apart from that, I probably haven't listened to Love Drive for a little while, and I massively enjoyed that yesterday. Massively enjoyed it. It's the whole idea of absence makes the heart grow fonder, isn't it? And definitely coming to something with a new perspective helps as well. Um, Again, Love at First Sting being the example of that, that, you know, I've got a, a newfound appreciation for Still Loving You. I'm Leaving You was also always a decent track. 
Big City Knights again they played at Wembley and I, I really enjoyed that the last couple of weeks. Is it something that when I come back to it again in six months, I think, oh God, you're just living off the concert, forget it. And going back to Judas Priest as a discussion, they released their new album, Invincible Shield, earlier on in the year. And despite every other person that I've, that I've heard loving it, I've not gone on with it. Which, whatever opinion you've got of an album, it isn't a problem because we're all different. But Firepower, their previous album, is probably my top five Judas Priest albums. It's tremendous. It's absolutely fantastic. But my point is this. Do I then come back to Invincible Shield later on in the year and think, what was I on about at the time? Did I come into it with too much expectation and I was a bit disappointed from there? Because I've not, I've not even heard the full album. I listened to the first four tracks, I think. Panic Attack is a good track. I've listened to that a number of times. But other than that, I think The Serpent and The King was one track, and I can't remember the other one. And I have to say, I wasn't that impressed. But then, I didn't buy the album, I just listened to it on YouTube, and is YouTube or Spotify a bit compressed? I'm not an audiophile, but I feel like rock music in particular, like I was just saying about the 2001 remasters of the Scorpion stuff. If the sound's not great, does that irk you a little bit? Particularly when it comes to rock music and you're trying to play it loud? I don't know, it certainly does me. So, my final point here, and it is it is another interesting debate to bring to the table. Um, and actually, I have got one more example which I'll quickly flash up before. Um, Brian Adams, a little bit of a genre change, a little bit softer, but still great music nonetheless. His Reckless album from 1984, his big album. Um, but funnily enough, this gets a hell of a lot of airplay. And, and for once, it's actually the an album before that uh, it's Brian Ad Brian Adams' second album. You want it, you got it. And um, no one makes it right is a track that I've listened to over the last couple of weeks, and I think it's brilliant. But that track, when I've listened to the album before, hasn't really hasn't really come out as one that's that's the best for me. But listen to it in a new light, a different circumstance. I thought, oh, that's really good. But again, it comes back to that debate: is it because I've heard Summer of '69 and it's only love and kids want to rock too often that something different is quite pleasurable. The case for Return to Forever is made even more complicated by the fact that there are a few of these tracks which are actually unreleased tracks from old recordings. So, um, if I get this correct, Scorpions did Sting of the Tail, then we're going to finish after 2010. Then they did another tour, then did MTV Unplugged. And I wanted to do one final album for the fans, which was unreleased outtakes from the past, making them cleaner, etc, etc, and putting them out as an album. Kind of a, a final farewell thank you to the fans. And that, in, in turn, is what re Returns Forever is in, in some aspects. Albeit, I've just read the Wikipedia page, and there, uh, there's only a few tracks that are old tracks on this. Um, Catch Your Look and Play, for example, one of my favourites, is from the Savage Amusement era. Um, let me get this right. There's, there are a couple of tracks. I know one is was written in the late 90s, another one in the early 80s. But generally speaking, most of these are new tracks. But if you go for that first idea that some of them are old tracks, does that then warp it because you've got an older feel? And I know some of the reviews, again, lukewarm to positive, have said that, and one review I think I'll quote directly from the review, that, it's almost like the Scorpions are trying to make it feel like it's 1985 again and Worldwide Live is going on forever. And that is the feel with Return to Forever. It is, and I pardon the pun, a return to form. Because Sting in the Tail, I, I do like the title track, Raised on Rock and The Best Is Yet to Come are a bit like the yearning for the past a little bit. and They're good tracks, but again, not the best. And that, that's what you tend to find sometimes when artists get to their their later career, at least I find that anyway in, in, in what I've listened to. But I know there's rarities to that and I know that some a lot of the legacy artists are still putting out good stuff today. But that does, does warp the argument a little bit. Um, but as I said, you, I've got to be careful here that I don't turn this discussion into is this album an underrated album against this album? It's certainly an interesting discussion. Whether I've provided any answers to my questions in the last 25 minutes or so, I don't know. 
but I know I know for certain that I can answer the question um, and answer the thing that posed this, the whole debate that Phil ranks his albums by the ones he plays the most. I can answer that question at least by saying I don't do that. And don't get me wrong, there's no problem with what Phil does, there's no problem with what anybody does. I'd actually prefer to do that because it would save me a lot of a lot of thinking, oh, you know, I, I can't rank this album against the other because it's just too complicated, there's not a lot in it. But to answer the question, this, every day of the week, is above this. But which one do I play the most? That one. Which one's better? That one. If anything, that's that's the one question I'll answer today. And I'm quite comfortable in, an in answering that. But, do I still like this album? Yes. Do I like this album? Yes. Do I like this album? Yes. And I could hold up every album that I've shown today. And I, and I like them all. Um, maybe Hot in the Shade by Kiss was, and that one's here, so I haven't got to go over too much. Maybe this was the real massive tangent that you could take this on. This is probably the weakest argument because there are some, there are a couple of tracks on here, but mm, apart from that, um, it's not that fantastic. I think I'm going to call it a day there because I'm going to probably keep going around in circles else, but I thought it was an interesting discussion nonetheless. Uh, coming back to, is it a case of, should we rank albums? And it's it's not a case of should we. I think that's probably the wrong the wrong phrase. But it's an interesting debate that some people rank the albums by the ones that play the most. I don't do that. Then the other question is, do we get tired of the old classic albums and then almost force ourselves to listen to the new albums? Mm -hmm. And then the other debate, which is another interesting one, is... Go over here. Almost one, two, three. Is... Is coming to something the second time round with a new perspective better? Because I've found that a hell of a lot. And I think if I hadn't have given things a second try... And this is more of a life lesson, to be quite honest, than anything outside of music. Coming back to something a second time is really worth it. Because 75% of the time, you enjoy it. And there's... I I'd think it's just my natural demeanour to be hesitant towards new things. So, the first time round, I always go in thinking, mm -hmm. I'm not sure about that. But then I'll, 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 I'll make my way in and, and uh, explore a little bit more. Another example before I go, Moody Blues on the threshold of a dream. That was the first arm of theirs I listened to, and I listened to it for the first time, and I thought, what the bloody hell's this? Listened to it a couple more times and thought it was great. Can I just listen to any music and think it's great? I certainly hope not. I'd hope I've got more of an identity than that. But yeah, I think I have. I think I have. But anyway, I'm going to call it a day there because I'd ramble all day. If you've enjoyed this sort of content, this is more of the content that I'd like to make. Um, not just pushing stuff out every week for the sake of it. But when an idea comes to my head like this one, it is nice to sit in front of the camera, talk to you guys and ponder my thoughts away. Because I think when you're having a conversation in your head... And you haven't got the notes. You don't quite get to the answers. And as I say, I don't know if I've got to the answers today. But the one thing I'm sure about is that both Return to Forever and Animal Magnetism are good albums. Animal Magnetism is by far the better album. But Return to Forever is the one I play the most. Make what you want of that. Thank you for your company today. I've been Toby Jones. And until the next time, I'll see you all later. Goodbye.